Um, so let me just pull up my opening statement here. Sorry, thought I had it. I, I keep trying to make sure that that's clear and apparent that there's no. Carrie, oh, we, can, we could hear you, but are you, are we good? Ready to go when you are, Madam Chair. All right, great, awesome. Okay. All right, then I'm gonna call this hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee to order. Um, for the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the Chair of Ways and Means. Um, I, this hearing is being recorded. It's being live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel L82, and Fios Channel 964. Um, I'll remind folks that this is part of the Council's about 35 working sessions and hearings on the department budgets. Um, if you'd like to testify at a hearing, uh, you can go to boston.gov slash budget-testify, um, and there's a place to upload videos, place to submit your written comments, which you can also do by emailing ccc.wm at boston.gov. Um, and uh, there's also a place to sign up to testify live in the Zoom, and then we'll get you the Zoom link. Um, there will be a number more hearings. You can find the calendar at boston.gov slash council dash budget. Um, and on June 3rd at 6 p.m., we'll be having a dedicated public testimony hearing. Um, so if daytime hearings are not great for you and you want to make your voice heard on the budget, um, we'll be taking any and all comments on that day on June 3rd at 6 p.m. Uh, you can also informally uh, tweet us your comments and questions on the budget at hashtag BOS budget, it's BOS budget. Um, today's hearing is on docket 0524 to 0526, orders for the FY22 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Docket 0527 to 0528, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations, and docket 0529 to 0531, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Um, and I'm joined here uh, so far by my colleagues, Councillor Ricardo Arroyo, District 5, Councillor Liz Braden, District 9, Councillor Anissa Sabi george uh, at large, and Councillor Ed Flynn, um, District 2. Uh, and um, the focus of today's hearing, it's actually a carryover of our Boston Police Department hearing. Um, so the council had a large number of questions for the police department um, that were submitted in advance, um, and we weren't able to get um, written answers to many of those in advance of the last hearing. Um, so we continued the conversation to today um, and I'm grateful to the department for working um, away on those answers in the meantime. Um, counselors have in their inboxes two documents, one that came this morning, one that came a few minutes ago um, with written answers to a number of questions. So, um, so it would be great if counselors could flip to that and just see, um, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that, you know, the second one has just arrived, uh, but um, see sort of what the responses are and, and kind of inform your follow-up questions on that basis. Um, we're, I see we're joined here by Lisa O'Brien, the Deputy Director um, and Chief Financial Officer for the district. Um, and uh, uh, Superintendent Hassan um, had a, had a long planned um, commitment today. So she'll be holding up the financial team side. Uh, and then we've got uh, Superintendent Kevin McColdrick uh, from the Bureau of Field Services, Superintendent Nora Baston from the Bureau of Community Engagement and Superintendent Marcus Eddings um, for, on court and paid details uh, with us. I think that's the team. Um, so uh, I know that the department has indicated in their written response to us some topics that were probably easier to answer verbally than to write out an answer to. Um, we do appreciate the you know, data answers um, that you conveyed over and um, I'll, I'll be going through counselors to sort of do follow-up questions. We're not going to do lots of, um, you know, this is a continuation of that other hearing. Um, but I want to first give the department a chance, if there's anything that you want to kind of um, walk through up top, uh, I'll, I'll give you all the floor first before we jump into counselor questions. So um, I don't know if Superintendent Baston or if anyone wants to lead off. Um, no, I, I don't have the question, so I, I'm just here to answer any questions directed to the Bureau. Great. Lisa, would it be best if we just jump straight into questions, or did you have anything you wanted to say up top? 
I think we should just jump right into the question. Okay. Great, great. Um, so uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask one or two just to give my colleagues a chance to pull theirs out. Um, so one question I had, I, I appreciated the number of sort of us getting that 21.9 million in overtime, that's about 330,000 hours. Um, and if we kind of divide that out, it's the equivalent of getting 153 officers back to work. And we have had this really large, totally, I mean, like very out of historic line number um, of officers. So I guess, um, so that that's a helpful reference point. Um, I guess, Lisa, I'm still, I'm still left wondering a little bit, like, do we, in terms of like a schedule of when we see cadets coming on and when we see, uh, you know, the potential for, cause you know, is that, you know, do we think we can get a lot of the officers who are gonna get back on the force, back on the first of the force in the first six months of the year? Like, how are we thinking about what progress markers towards these goals look like? Cause I, I will just say it just, it seems, it seems like a really heavy lift to get that many people back it, on the force. It's, it's gonna be a heavy lift. I'm not gonna deny that. I think that, um, like we had said in previous meetings before, uh, Madam Chair, we have been severely hindered with the COVID virus, as many, as every individual here in this room has had. Um, not only were our OCK Health Department shut down or was concentrated on COVID exposures and COVID positives for the most part of this past year, um, obviously none of our officers that have been out injured were able to get to see their providers and the treatments or the surgeries that they needed to get them back and get them well. So it's been staggered for about, been basically halted for a good year. We're, we're making an aggressive push to get them back. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is the, the low hanging fruit is so for officers as they, you know, file an injury report, we get them within the 24 hours. We have the case management system set up where we're calling those officers right away. Say, hey, can you come in? Let's take a, take a look. What services do you need? We provided, um, we also contracted with Brighton um, Occupational Health to actually facilitate some of these visits for our offices that might not be able to get the services that need, that they need because doctors are backed up. Um, you know, services have been delayed and people have been on hold and waiting. So Bright Knock Health now, if we can get them over to Bright Knock Health, they have a lot of the services that they need to get them on the road to recovery. It's, it's, a, it's gonna be an aggressive push on our part. Um, I indicated in several uh, parts of this document that we added to our triage team. Um, we have a physician on board now. We have a physician's assistant uh, on board and we also have a nurse practitioner on board and they're aggressively starting to see offices. The unfortunate thing that we can't control is we can't look into a crystal ball to see our offices get an injury. If we did, we, we could prevent some of these injuries. But for example, we got quite a few offices back last week. And I want to say approximately 10 went out injured this past weekend with some of the, the issues that went on throughout the city this weekend. But we are making an aggressive push and um, um, we're all hands on deck for this. And, and we're also the recruit classes graduate and I want to say the June 6th or June 10th. So there'll, there'll be about 93, 94 offices, new offices coming out on the street in June. I can't hear you, Councillor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, you know, you think you run so many of these, you would learn to unmute yourself, but still no, no luck. Um, no, I, I appreciate all that. Um, I, yeah, I just, it's, it's just obviously reaching these numbers just seems really kind of Herculean. Um, the, and in terms of, um, I appreciate the kind of extended written answers to my questions about the training that um, our cadets and officers receive. Um, and so I won't go back over all of that, but I guess just if you could speak to concretely how, if at all, the cadet training that the proposed classes for this year ha would have would be different from, um, from past years or if it's gonna be fairly continuous. I know that a lot of the post stuff hasn't come in yet and a lot of that has to do with ongoing training anyways, but just curious whether um, we expect the 
what the cadets are being exposed to to be significantly different from past. Um, if I if I may, um, just so so that we're not confusing people, with all due respect, um, we refer to the recruits in the academy as recruit, recruit okay. recruits in the cadets. So I just don't want to pose confusion for people when they're listening to this, because cadets are civilians um, with the, with the ex, with the hopes that they'll want to become police officers and the cadets hopefully will diversify our police force. So I just, so the recruit training, um, I would probably want to refer that over to Superintendent McGoldrick since I'm not a sworn. I did attach quite extensive um, answers from Superintendent Cotter and her team at the academy, um, as well as quite a few attachments along with the de-escalation training that we currently have. The training that they follow at the, the academy is, um, based on MPTC, which that guideline is attached as well. But as far as the actual training at the academy, I think it would be best served if, if one of the sworn superintendents spoke to that since I'm not I'm not in the weeds of the training with the academy. So Councilor, the, um, the training will be conducted in, in generally the same timeline. There will be some additional oversight uh, with the post uh, construct coming online. So uh, a lot of what we do was compliant with, with, what, the, with what the post contemplated. Uh, we are focusing on de-escalation. We're focusing on, uh, on some intervention roles and, and you know, various, um, various things that the post and the Mass, Mass Police Training Council wanted to, uh, wanted to adjust a little bit, but it'll all be done within the same timeline generally. And, and the, uh, you know, that will also dovetail with some, with some ongoing in-service training for officers that are already on the street. Okay, great. And, and, can, and one last one for me is just, sorry, because I want to make sure I get this clearly. So, so the cadets are um, an, an avenue into being a recruit. Correct. So, right. so the cadets, if after two years of service, uh, the cadets get, get preferential treatment. Um, with respect of where they line up on the civil service or, or you know we have the civil service list that we have you know and there's different preferential treatment for veterans disabled veterans and then the cadets get preferential treatment to move them um, quite a bit to the top as well of the list and so clarify for me the proposal from the administration is 225 person recruit classes yeah, so there's two for 125, and then we're actually going to incre increase the cadet size. Currently, we have roughly about um, 40. We actually probably have about 29, 30 cadets currently on board. Um, a few of them, I'm excited to say, are going into the academy in June, which is good. Our cadet actually, uh, Jayla, just ran into our office the other day to say she passed the MPTC, so we've been rooting her on. Um, and the city has made an, an investment for another 20 cadets for a total of 60. For next year, got it. And so, and sorry, and the 125, it's it's across the two recruit classes totals 125, or they're each 125. No, each class is going to be a total of 125. I would like to point out too that we always work with the folks at OBM, um, and, and always are looking at attrition. And so, the second class could be adjusted a little bit based on the attrition level. So we're always looking at the, these retirements live and the OBM will try to always accommodate us should we have to kind of tweak the class a little bit. But right now we have 125 slated to go in um, at the end of June, June 28th. But the, and then the 60 who are in a cadet class would not then, would not then be likely entering this cycle of academy. Correct, correct. And, and quite a few of the cadets that we currently have on board will probably go into the second class versus the first class because of their two-year two um, commitment or their two-year tenure hasn't completed yet for them to enter the academy. And is that two years of full-time work as a civilian with the department or is that a sort of side thing that people are doing while they're doing other things? Sorry, this is a very... Well, the cadets are full-time here, but many of the cadets... Um, Quite a few of them go to school at night, you know, to get their undergraduate degree or advanced degree. Um, but for the most part, I, 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 I'm not sure um, if many of them have second jobs, but it's a full-time commitment here with the police department. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I see that Superintendent Baston's hand is up, so I wanna go to her. I just wanted to add one thing about the cadets and why it's so important. We, um, to make in the department diverse. So the cadets we get to actually um, have interviews and, and kind of handpick the cadets are so that's why it's an important element because a portion of them are automatically going to go most likely into the police academy 
So that's why it's like a pipeline to the Boston police. So it, you know, it is a, a real good tool for us to make the cadet class diverse, which will also help make the department diverse. So it's a very important, um, you know, thing to have attached to the recruit class. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Now I think I, I uh, will let my colleagues um, ask their questions. Um, so the order will be Arroyo, Braden, Asabi, George, Flynn. Then we are also joined by Councillor Julia Mejia um, and Councillor Andrea Campbell. Um, uh, Councillor Arroyo? I know he was he just had to go off screen. Councillor Arroyo, are you there? Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. I stepped away one second to go grab my post-its. Uh, and so, uh, are we free to start questions now? Yes, it's going to you. All right, fantastic, thank you. I wasn't sure if I was the first one here. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. Quick uh, question, uh, something that I recently came to my attention uh, is the City of Boston Municipal Code. Uh, I was speaking with Councillor Yancey, uh, former Councillor Yancey, who actually had written this ordinance, which is still on the books, uh, specifically if you go to the City of Boston Municipal Code, it's Chapter 11. It's the first one on the books. It's 1111. It's a weekly report by the police commissioner. Uh, and I'm just going to read that to you. And it says the, the relevant portion, there's a first portion, which is about the reporting of homicides uh, to the council and the mayor. But there's a second portion of that, which is the police commissioner shall also prepare and furnish each week for, to the mayor and to the city of council a report on the deployment of sworn police officers to each district by shift. This report shall include the use of overtime, leave taken by officers and officers assigned to each district, but assigned out to other districts. Uh, that's information I've been trying to get, frankly, for a while. It turns out, legally, you are already supposed to be getting that. And since I've been on this council, we've been out of compliance. Uh, when can I expect the BPD to come back into compliance with those weekly reports? I think a lot of that data is uh, posted publicly. We can look at the... Um... Some of the staffing data is, is probably not posted publicly. Publicly, we can uh, develop that. Uh, actually, have some of it in front of me right now, um, and I think you're I think you're provided with that as part of the uh, the documents that were prepared for for this session. Yeah, I have the sworn breakdown for today. But what this is talking about is every week we're supposed to get a deployment of officers to each district. That includes the use of overtime, leave taken by officers, and is broken down by shift. Uh, I don't know anywhere where I can get all that information, uh, but apparently by ordinance and, and by law, we're supposed to be. So uh, my hope is that that gets back in line to where it was. Uh, he was actually, the reason this came up is he had heard that I was looking for this data and he said, you're not getting that weekly because we used to. Uh, and so that is, that is there, it's on the books. And so I hope that we see uh, that come back into compliance. Um, and so beyond that, uh, Councilor Arroyo, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm actually going to take a very quick recess because we've got some issue with the stream on the council yeah. website. And obviously, from an open meeting law perspective, if it's not up there, we're not having. So let, I'm sorry, everybody. I'm just going to throw us into recess for a second while I figure this out.
We're not quite there, but we're almost there. All right, the live stream is up. Um, I am going to gavel this back into session. Um, uh, all right, so hopefully now I think everyone in the public can watch us, which is a key element of these things. Um, so uh, um, now, sorry, Councilor Arroyo. And I should say, so the whole hearing that we had up to now was recorded. It was streaming on YouTube. It's all going to be on the TV. It's just that we had a section. It wasn't on the Boston.gov link, and that's where lots of folks watched the hearing. So we needed to solve that problem, but we have now solved it. Um, but so we don't have to go and repeat everything that we did before. Um, so, Councilor Arroyo, why don't you um, get going? Just to be clear, this is probably going to be over two rounds because there's a number of different things here. But uh, the city of Boston in 2015 did a police department operational audit and review uh, that was conducted by the Public Safety Strategies Group. And they released a, let me just see what the total here is, I believe it's 63 pages of recommendations and analysis of the Boston Police Department's operational uh, status, essentially. And I just want to go through this and see what of their recommendations have actually been taken into account. And again, this was in 2015. And so uh, on the executive summary of it, they go into uh, details, which I, I guess will probably take up the rest of this five minutes because there's a number of things here and then we'll go into the other ones. Uh, but one of the issues that they had with the detail structure in 2015 was, and I'm quoting, there is currently a decentralized process of scheduling detail that is staffed with sworn department members. Both the staffing with sworn members and administrative processes are ineffective. The department needs to civilianize and automate the process. Where are we on that? Have we done anything there? That would be subject of a uh, contract negotiations to, to change those jobs. So we've, we've attempted to have negotiations with, with the various unions, but I think it's at the point where it'd be a, a main table discussion, if I'm not mistaken. And was the last contract, if I'm not mistaken, was 2017? Uh, probably, yeah, probably 2017, yeah. So two years after this. And so they didn't change that in the contract in 2017, is basically what I'm hearing? Yeah, I'm not sure what the parameters of the um, main table dis discussions were in 2017. So it, it appears they didn't get to this. And is that is that staffing, is that, so just to be clear, what you're saying is that staffing is dictated by that contract. There's nothing the department can do beyond that contract in terms of, the process of scheduling details that is now done by sworn department members? My understanding that shifting those jobs from sworn to another bargaining unit position would require uh, negotiations with, with the impacted unions, yes. Thank you. That's I good did, to I did confirm that, Council, with our, our Office of Labor Relations the other day that if we're shifting responsibility from one bargaining unit to another bargaining unit, it has to be bargained. So all of these kind of changes, just so the public knows, all of these changes would have to happen even if we had a willing and able BPD command staff that was willing to make these changes, it's still dictated by that contract. Yes, well, because you're shifting shifting one function out of one un a union to shifting it to another union. So it would have to be bargained for. That's that's good to know. And I know this next part is also part of the bargain, uh, but I just want to get a couple of things on record. Uh, notably because the Boston Patrolmen's Police Patrolmen's Association has started a campaign that says that these don't cost taxpayers any money. And here I am on page 56, uh, and I'm quoting again from this, this independent review. <clears throat> Often public safety agencies state that details do not cost the city any money and in essence provide free police coverage. This statement is not wholly correct. Police details do cost the city money. 
the city vendors, administrative staff to enter payroll information, and the fiscal staff to bill the vendors for the detailed work by the officers, all paid. Then it subsequently goes on to say, and I'm quoting again, in February of 2013, the city commissioned a study to review the collection of detailed payments from vendors. At that time, the city was owed over $24 million for services rendered. This review showed that there were significant amount of funds, $8 million specifically, that needed to be written off as uncollectible. And so I had a question with Public Works the other day about this, which is we build into our contracts for details for city projects this detail payment, the payment that we make for details. And yet, uh, do we know specifically, I think it's around 50%, but I'd love confirmation, how many details are actually filled? Yeah, good afternoon. Approximately 50% of the details go unfilled every day. Yeah, and so part of my issue with that is what Public Works brought up, which I think is a really relevant point here, is that the reason we have details in the first place is worker safety. That's the reason that we do this, is worker civilian safety. And if what we're sending as a, as a, as a statement to contractors to repaying, by the way, for those unfilled details, but even as we do that, we're not providing safety to our, our public works folks, our folks out there doing work because they don't have details 50% of the time. And if we're not allowed to civilianize that at some point, and I recognize this is a contract issue, but I wanna make clear what the problem here is, that we're, we're letting 50% of our workers go without any kind of safety on, on the ground there. And so I'll just skip ahead from that because I recognize the detail process is sort of out of your hands in the sense that it's a contractual thing. Um, in terms of the command staff, this report said that command staff deployment, I'm quoting again, it's page 29 if anybody's following along, command staff deployment needs review as some positions may not be appropriately deployed. Superintendents with assignments that lack staff or specific responsibilities or oversight of similar services in the department, night commander zone, commanders only in one zone. Have we done anything since 2015 to, to alleviate that issue? I don't think there's been significant changes to uh, to the structure of the command staff uh, in the past five years. Has there been any reason for that? Any specific reason as to why? Is it a contractual cause or is it just we just haven't done it? No, it's not. It's not a contractual issue with the command staff. I think there's... Uh, you know, that there may be some disagreement with the authors of that study about the uh, the value of having a senior level command staff on, on night command, depending on uh, depending on what what uh, instances could could happen, whether it's, you know, at the night, the, the only real command staff you'd have would be the night command. So, you know, just to take that example, uh, you know, th there are times where that's pretty beneficial to have a, a senior command level person uh, available. One of the, I appreciate that answer. Thank you, uh, uh, Superintendent. Uh, one of the questions I have here is about overtime lacking oversight, page 53. It's pretty damning of our process. Uh, it says, quote, the department does not use a process that has a high degree of accountability regarding the issuance of general overtime. Quote, it appears that the amount of overtime allocated is based on the previous year's overtime usage, not necessarily actual need. Then further down, it says supervisors are not using the information to decrease the overtime encumbered. The department needs to put additional measures in place to control the overtime through the review of data, public safety, uh, public safety, what is the name of this organization? Just to be accurate to who actually conducted the study. The public safety strategies group uh, learned that some specialized units may be routinely coming in early and working late. This practice needs to be reviewed with the supervisors of these units in a very detailed manner as it is not apparent as to why this is occurring. For example, the number of members in some specialty units has increased, yet the total amount of overtime is also increasing. And so have we done anything in the six years since this report said that our, and I quote, the department does not use a process that has a high degree of accountability regarding the issuance of general overtime, and that some of that is, and I quote again, not based on necessarily actually needed overtime. What, what have we done since 2015 to revamp the overtime process, if anything? Well, there's pretty significant controls on overtime in terms of, um, you know, some of the district level overtime expenditures need to be approved by, by the captain of that district and the supervisors that, that are working that particular shift. Uh, if it's, if it's say, an extended tour where there's a crime scene that requires officers to stay, uh, I'm not aware of any any units in my bureau, which is the biggest bureau, uh, that, that routinely are allocated time to come in early. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would be certainly an exception uh, to have planned overtime like that. Uh, to their point, I would say 
it would be beneficial, and I think we've been been trying to get this for a while. Instead of having the, the paper overtime slips and processing them the way we were doing back in 2015 and are still doing today, I think an automated system where we could track it in pretty close to real time, which would obviously benefit our our ability to, to just pull it up on a screen and, and, and see how the, the trends are looking and if there's anything that seems anomalous. Uh, and and the, also the, the benefit would be to, uh, to produce the report that, that you discussed. Right now, uh, that weekly report regarding overtime, I think, would be pretty challenging for our, our payroll systems as they're currently uh, configured. So I guess, and I see the gavel, so I'm going to end it here and then go to the next uh, next turn through so that I respect other people's time. But just specifically to this report, from the issuance of this report in December of 2015, you're, you're essentially telling me that there hasn't been any change to the overtime process structurally. It's still the same overtime process. Well, structurally, in terms of how overtime is is submitted, is the same. It's not automated. There's been no. There's what about no the change. way that the amount of overtime is allocated, which it says is based on the previous year's overtime usage, not necessarily actual need. That's quoted from the report. Is that still? Yeah, allocated? I'm not really sure where they're coming up with that. Like in in the districts, I don't see districts with an allocated number of you know, hey, you, each district gets 100 hours of overtime to use. Captains don't continue to receive, as this report says. It says each district and specialized unit is assigned an overtime bank at the beginning of each year. That's no longer true? Uh, it's, everything has to be justified. Whether if you have a certain amount of overtime, you can exceed it if something goes you know, significantly, significantly more impactful to your district. But there's also, you can't just use overtime uh, sim simply because that, that you might not be you might not be exceeding some arbitrary cap. You still have to explain why you have people in certain locations. I hear all that, and I see the gavel. And, and frankly, what I didn't get from your answer, and maybe we'll do it on the second round, is what in practice has actually changed? What have we fundamentally put in place to ensure that doesn't happen anymore? Because what I'm hearing is, it, frankly, sort of the process works, or whatever this is, minus the paper process of accounting for it, but the process for allotment works. And I haven't heard how we changed it from that. In fact, when I spoke to my captains, most recently, they do speak about having an overtime bank and what they're sort of allowed to use for overtime hours. And so I'll leave it there, uh, Chair, Madam Chair, and, and I'll need a second round. Thank you for the indulgence. Great. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Braden, and then Councillor Asabi George, Flynn, Mejia Campbell. I'll, I'll text that order over. Councillor Braden. You, Madam, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you uh, for the um, the written responses to our questions. It's been very helpful. Um, I haven't had time to read through all the responses yet, but uh, thank you all the same. Um, I had a few questions. Um, you know, I really uh, think the cadet core is, is really important and um, a great way to develop a pipeline for young recruits to come in, uh, young, young people to come into the police force and, and uh, and diversify our, 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 our force. Um, I'm just curious about what sort of duties the cadets do and um, in the course of their tenure with you as cadets, what sort of training do they get? And are there ever instances in which cadets would be called up to support um, sworn officers? Cadets generally do administrative functions, whether it's in headquarters or in a district. Um, they, they get a pretty pretty broad perspective of how the department operates over there, um, generally two-year tenure in the department. Um, they, they do support the, the sworn officers in the sense that um, it's a pretty cost-effective way to have people say, it. if you're at a district, they can take reports at a, you know, a front desk, just taking you know, some reports they can't take, but generally they can take your typical reports you'll see at, at, at a district station, and that helps uh, free up officers to do other things that, that they're more suited for. Uh, I agree. It's, it's a great program, and it's got tremendous benefits, I think, to the city overall. Very good. Um, and then um, another question really is with regard to um, your um, the best clinicians. I know when I spoke to the captain out here in District 14 uh, in terms of emergency calls, he said there's a very high incidence of mental health calls. And um, uh, I, I don't, I'm sure it varies from district to district, but um, what sort of... Um, uh, in terms of um, introducing the, the best clinicians and uh, utilizing their skills, um, where are we at with that program? 
So we've hired a, a number of best clinicians and, and added significantly to uh, to what we had just just a few months ago, and, and that's an ongoing process. We've also expanded the street outreach unit, which uh, which works closely with with the best clinicians, uh, and they can also be teamed up with uh, with an officer in, in the district. Uh, not every district has a dedicated best clinician right now, but we're trying to get there, uh, and it, it is definitely a situation that uh, that. The entire city could benefit from it. It's not just particular areas. The demand is higher in some districts than others, but uh, certainly the co-response model that, that this is basically uh, enhancing is is becoming much more widely accepted across the country, and I think it's extremely beneficial. Uh, you know that there are people that don't want the police involved in some of these calls at all, and I think if we can get there on some types of calls, I think that's certainly beneficial. But as, as a you know, as a way to augment. Uh, mental health, you know, the potential mental health capacity that people are trying to, to build uh, without the police, which I think is great. But there are calls that, that I think a co-response is uh, is valuable, and, and this is a great model to uh, a great model to advance that objective. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I think it's uh, Councillor Asabi George. Oh, actually, might have had to step away for a minute. Um, sorry, I missed that note. Uh, Councillor Flynn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach, and thank you to Superintendent uh, McGoldrick, Baston, and um, Eddings for being here, as well as as well as Lisa O'Brien as well. Um, I asked a question the previous hearing, and I got a written response. The question I asked was, what is, a, what is the budget for the health and wellness of our police officers and their families? And I asked that question because it's important for us to focus on exactly that, the health and the wellness of our police officers and their families as well, especially during this difficult time. We want a healthy police department um, with services in funding for those services, including um, clinical mental health uh, counseling, wellness. Um, so I'm not as concerned about getting offices back from um, being out as I am making sure that our offices that are out are getting the necessary medical care um, so that they can come back healthy. Um, and I don't, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to rush anybody to come back to the job if they're still not, not healthy enough. So as a returning, as a returning veteran, we need to make sure that we give our veterans the necessary and the opportunity to get engaged in the VA healthcare system. But we also want to make sure we make sure the police officers, police officers that are out for various reasons also get the medical care that they need as well. Um, so having said that, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Superintendent McGoldrick, um, what, is, what are we looking at during this pandemic? Difficult year for everybody, but do we have enough money in the budget to make sure that police officers have the medical care, whether it's stress, um, stress counseling or family counseling, available to them during this difficult uh, period of time? I think we do. I spoke with uh, Sergeant King uh, the other day who runs the peer support unit. He's, he's doing an excellent job. Uh, he's he's certainly aware of, of most of the issues that, that are going on in the department and has aligned resources to uh, to address any issues. Uh, I saw recently some some budget requests and, and I anticipate that they are you know that it's not exorbitant to, to run that program the right way uh, and it, it, it is it is seen as a model and I, I know um, from from what I've heard from officers who have uh, who have mentioned their experience with the peer support unit that it has uh, it has the confidence of, of the people that, that work for the department uh, and frankly beyond not, not every department has that capability so they do uh, they do rely on the expertise of, of uh, Sergeant King and, and his people there. So I, I think we're in pretty good shape as far as that goes, Councillor. I'd also like to add to Councillor, if I may, that um, this year as a result of COVID, we, we received a supplemental COVID grant from JAG, the Justice uh, Department, and basically 61,000 additional funds were awarded to the peer support for the on-site academy. academy. 
uh, the 61,000 was specifically slated to assist those offices as well as their families who were, were dealing with the emotional effects of COVID, whether they had, you know, COVID exposures, COVID positivity, and how also helping their families who were dealing with offices that might be coming home with COVID exposures or COVID post positivity, and that has helped immensely as well. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Superintendent, for that for that answer. I appreciate it. I think that's an important part of um, policing is making sure our officers and their families are healthy. Um, let me let me ask one other question. I guess um, I always felt that we need more police officers to be hired every year, and consistently, I think we probably need to hire 200 police officers at least a minimum a year. I understand that about 100 retire every year. So just to keep up with that, you probably need to hire at least 150, 100, 200 every year for several several years. Um, I, go to, I go to every community meeting in my district. Um, I don't miss any of them. I work at work at seven days a week, seven nights a week, and I don't take any time off. The the at these neighborhood meetings, the first person that speaks after the neighborhood president is the CSO, and the CSO community service officer gives a gives an update on crime stats or community policing. In every every neighborhood that I represent, the South End, South Boston, and Chinatown, people are asking for more police on the street. They're not asking, they're asking for more patrols. They're asking for bike patrols. Um, so I'm, I'm in the neighborhood every every single day in my district and I've never heard anybody ask me to, um, you know, cut the police. So I know the critical role they play in our city and they protect the lives of, of our seniors, of persons with disabilities and they play a critical role in, in our society. So I just want to acknowledge that up front. Um, let's see. And then my final question, um, whoever might want to answer it. Uh, can we talk about the, I know we were talking about the cadet program. I also see them in the community as well, especially during civic nights or community events. I was with before the pandemic, I spent a lot of time with Superintendent Baston at various community events, and I would see the cadets, and they were engaging with the residents of the city, and they reflected well upon the city of Boston, the police department. Um, what other what other assistance can they play, Superintendent, in in our city um, from from your experience? Yeah. Um, yeah, great question. So I think that one of the main things for the cadets, like we were saying, is that it's our job to teach them to be future police officers. So what better way to teach them is to teach them how to engage with the community. So what we try to do now and what we do in the Bureau is when we have community events to get more cadets involved so when they're learning the job, part of the learning the job is to be in different communities they're not from, learn how to engage with kids, learn how to go in communities that might not know the police, and that's what we're trying to do, because part of the job is to prepare them to be able to come out, put on the blues, and walk down to a basketball court that they're not familiar with. And so that is, I think, the most effective way of um, the cadets, you know, administrative work, of course, learning the desk and how to write reports, but also just engaging. So the more they can go out and engage, the more community events they can go across the city, um, the better we are preparing them. And you know, Cadet Murph, and a bunch of the cadets that have come through the Bureau um, get to see that, and that's going to get them more prepared to do exactly what we want, positive engagement in our community. So I think now we do a better job of including other cadets from other districts, even if they work inside. I give um, Superintendent McGoldrick a call. We might borrow some of his cadets. So we're trying to really engage all the cadets as much as we can um, in community events. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, Council Bach, is that it for me? Or do I have one more question? You can slip in one more question. Counselor. Okay, a, a quick question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of the bike patrol unit. Um, I see the incredible work they do in the city. Uh, can you? Can someone give me a, a, a quick update on the bike patrol unit? So, Council, they're out there. They're, they do a lot of work at um, around the uh, 
Molina Cass area, and there's, uh, the, you know, they're there every day. They're, they're out there at uh, all sorts of protests, and, and they're a good visible presence uh, in the South End on a regular basis as well. That they're very well, well received. Uh, we, we're down a few officers in the bike unit from where we had been a year ago, um, and, you know, hopefully when we get some officers out of the academy that that might be able to free up an opportunity for us to to add a few people back into the into the bike unit uh, i know there's always talk about specialized units and balancing the the needs of personnel and, and districts but uh you know the the bike unit and and, and other units this citywide uh approach and the flexibility to use them as needed is a real multiple Supplier effect for, for the size of their unit. They they really they accomplish a lot more than uh, than you would think by looking at the at the numbers of people we have there. So uh, so I, I agree they they do great work and uh, and, and I really uh, I like to see them out there and I know the community feels the same way. Thank, thank you, Superintendent, and thank you, Council Block, for letting letting me ask that final question. Well, thank you, Councillor Flynn, uh, Councillor Mejia, and then it'll be Councillor Campbell and then Councillor Lydia Edwards, District One, who joined us some time ago. Councillor Mejia. Yes, um, so thank you all for being here. Um, I just wanted to say a few things before I start with my questions, um, is that we worked really closely with then Councillor Janie on a black and brown budget agenda for Boston last year with a laundry list of police reforms that the people have been calling for for decades, including reallocating all violence prevention spending out of the BPD and into um, and into uh, the Boston Public Health Commission, getting rid of the gang database, investigating overtime fraud, and with an overall 10% reduction in the BPD budget. So far, we have not seen any of these requests made, but the need for these reforms haven't gone away. We can't continue giving people the lip service um, for these reforms when not delivering on them. It's been the same conversation for decades, and we're now in a position to actually make the changes that we need. So I really do appreciate some of the uh, responses that we received. Um, there was a question around um, uh, the first data presented by the BPD, um, and you all followed up with a written answer saying that the BPD does not stop and frisk. Rather, you have a frisk and search category for stops. Can you tell us the practical difference um, between stop and frisk and frisk and search? Because that's a little bit unclear. Um, my second question is, the police commissioner is required um, by the Trust Act to submit a report detailing their role in any relation to ICE. Why didn't we get the report last year? And when will we get the data from, from this past year? And then lastly, Part of the budget discussions last year was um, an understanding that the BPD would commit to being more engaged with the council. Since then, they have been routinely, we have felt like we've been routinely um, ignored. Um, and so to appear in person to testify and have denied um, requests for information. And I would like an, an understanding for why we're being ignored and what the plan is to make someone available to the council when needed. Um, and lastly, I lied, I have two more questions. We asked how many officers speak languages other than English and the BPD um, responded, there are many officers that speak a second um, languages, but there is currently no formal list to track such officers. Every other office in the city of Boston tracks how many people in their department speak languages other than English. Why does the BPD feel that it doesn't need to do the same? And lastly, how has the BPD involved, how, how has the BPD been involved in our, um, in or offered support to Dennis White during his trial? And that's it. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll start with the stop and frisk. Is that your first question? Okay, so stop and frisk, and, and then the category that, that checks off whether a person was frisked 
or searched uh, really don't have anything to do with each other. The checking off what occurred during during an engagement with someone is, is different from that policy of stop and frisk has the connotation of randomly stopping people and frisking them, which is not what we do. Each stop that has to be documented, which is what the FIO form is about, but that stop has to be based on an articulable reason for the stop. Independently, a frisk has to be based on an articulable reason that the officer felt he was in danger of, you know, potentially the person had a weapon and, and he had a frisk. And so that's an independent determination. Uh, so the stop and frisk as as one incident where people can go out and just stop people and frisk them is not, not something that the Boston police engage in. So uh, that's they're completely separate things. The fact that there's a, a check for frisk and a check for search just indicates that we want to document what happened during the stop. So that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't relate to a stop and frisk. It's just a documentation of what occurred during the stop. Did I, did I explain that to, to your satisfaction? You're muted, Councilor Mahia. Um, yes and no, I think. <laughs> Super, Superintendent, can I just ask for clarification? Is what you're saying that the, from the department's perspective, the distinction is that you didn't stop somebody in order to frisk them? Like you stopped them for some reason and then you check a box of whether you ended up searching them? Is that... So yes, yeah, so we, we we do have to document if someone was frisked or searched, which a search is much more intensive than, than a frisk, uh, and, and you would need probable cause for that. So uh, so basically, there is no stop and frisk. You know, we we just go out there and randomly stop people and frisk them. That that doesn't happen. That's not what the purpose of these FIOs, and and that's we need articulable reasons within the state and federal constitution to conduct our activities, which a random stop and frisk, which is the connotation that I think is being discussed, uh, is not something we would engage in. However, we would document if we frisk someone, we would document if we search someone according to the policy, and then that would be done either in the FIO or if an arrest is made. Uh, okay. so, on so, that, so that I'm clear, um, let's just drop the, fist, the frisk and the search component of it. What about just being stopped? in terms of what, what's what's your question about the, being stopped? The data. I mean, like, do, do you, are you capturing the data around how many people are just stopped, regardless of how you're labeling it? Like, right, that's, uh, the, sure, that, that's the purpose of, of the FIO. So so that would be, that's filled, that's filled out, regardless of whether anyone is searched or frisked, that form is filled out and then, you know, it can be, it can be saved for, for data if the person was in the vicinity of a shooting, say, and he was stopped, but we'd never enough to hold him or, and there was no, you know, they might note that the clothes he was wearing or what have you. And I'll just push back a little bit on that. You know, I feel like whether you're stopped or frisked or searched or whatever it is, I just, I don't know why we can't just call a spade a spade and then it is what it is. Um, at least well, that's the, the, we're the, it out here. There are legal distinctions that, that are important that, that we wouldn't just simply call something a stop and frisk because that's not what it is. Uh, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that because if you call something that and you accept that, you're accepting a standard that is incompatible with the law that we're obligated to follow. So that, that's why we wouldn't call it that. Well, I think emotionally people are experiencing it as such, regardless of what it's called and how it's labeled. But yeah, I have to, a few other questions, so maybe we can um, debate that one another time. Okay. Thank you. Can we go to um, the next question in regards to the ICE data? Yeah, I'm not sure why that wasn't supplied, except for the fact that I don't think we have any real uh, interaction with ICE. I'm not sure that we even get any any requests for detainees from them because they know that we, you know, they know that we're prohibited from from uh, from holding people on non-criminal warrants, which is what a detainer is. So. Uh, 
we I'll, I'll take a look at that and see what information is lacking but i think if if we haven't filled out the report that we should have we'll we'll, we'll catch up on that but i think the reality is, is there's no data to supply we don't you know we're, we're prohibited from having engagements with ice at that level so so i don't think there's anything that we can really report on that of substance but but if it's a matter of, of stating that then, then we should do so okay um and then can you talk to me a little bit about the language uh uh, accessibility and how you're tracking that or what you could potentially be doing in the future to better have an understanding of the languages that are spoken by your workforce? Yeah, I suppose we could uh, do a better job. Um, I, I think we're probably just, uh, you know, a victim of our own success in terms of we just go out on the air and say, hey, does anyone speak Spanish or Mandarin or what have you? And, and people answer up. And, and that even even if we had a database, that still may be the quicker way to do it. Uh, but but your point is well taken that, you know, if it's if that data is collected and potentially utilized elsewhere, then uh, then this it's probably a beneficial thing to have. There may be opportunities to uh, to leverage that knowledge in, in some instances, and I don't think it would be a particularly challenging uh, database to construct. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's I think that's a good idea. That's great. And then I, um, I asked this question in my last um, hearing, and I just really want to underscore um, when I talk about reallocation of funding um, in, in my opening statements. You know, when when I think about violence prevention and intervention. It's really about how we're utilizing those dollars to help prevent crime um, and also build community. And I'm just curious, I don't think I really got an answer when I asked the last time about what is there, why is there such a pushback around reallocating some of this funding to support um, proven community violence prevention efforts? Well, you know, I, I think the police department engages in violence prevention every day. Probably, you know, if we're to credit uh, any one entity with preventing violence, it would be the police department. And, you know, as, and, as a general sense, you know, the police officers are the, are the ones that are exposed to the effects of violence. We're the ones that are, you know, standing over a teenager and trying to render first aid. And we're the, you know, potentially the first one that, that came to their aid after they were shot or stabbed or, or a victim of a robbery or other violence. So we see that all the time on a personal level. On an economic level, which I think is what you're talking about, since it's a since it's a budget hearing, uh, you know that there is there's a pretty impactful uh, report along with a, a calculator developed by the Rand Corporation, which is obviously probably the preeminent research uh, corporation probably in the world, but it's it's certainly one of the top research corporations, and they put a cost on crime, and they put a, a cost to the effects of crime. And they also put a value on police officers. So, you know, I, I was just kind of looking at this concept and I, I put in the data for the number of officers we have and I put in our five-year average for our crime rates. And the information that, that I came up with is if we were to reduce our police force, and this is according to the RIN Corporation, you know, half of their research is a, a PhD level researchers, uh, we could expect a cost of $25 million as an economic impact just by cutting 100 police officers. Uh, conversely, if we were to add 100 police officers, we, we would see an improved economic impact on crime. So, you know, crime has a genuine economic impact. If you remove, if you remove officers and you remove some stability, especially when we're trying to recover from COVID, the economy's trying to get back on track. The last thing we need is, is to have a challenge to our economic viability because of instability and because of, of violence or crime or, or other issues that that will inevitably occur and and again this is this, this is data from rand which is which is pretty powerful i mean i think we need to i think we need to do what any business would do if we're going to cut resources if we're going to cut funding if we're going to cut people we have to look at both sides of the balance sheet it's not just what can you take off from costs it's what productivity are you losing and, and this rand study does a good job of, of quantifying that so i would just encourage us to look at both sides of the balance sheet if we're going to look at you know what would the impact be of cutting 100 teachers to the economy i'm, I'm sure there's a way to quantify that and i'm sure it wouldn't be good uh, but just just take a simple a simple example of someone running a factory you know if he could if you could hire 10 people and add, you know, 100,000 per person to productivity, would he do it? Probably. 
if if he cut 10 people and lost a million dollars in productivity. Would that seem like a bad bet? I think so. So that's basically what this RAND analysis would 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 allow you to see. And it's it's publicly available. You can you can run the numbers yourself and, and see what it looks like. Uh, but the, the reality is there are economic consequences to bad public policy. And I think defunding the police, and I know we had some people last time talk about abolishing the police and, and really curtailing the, the role of police. Uh, I think there's an economic cost to that, which I think is unwise. And, and I'd rather look at some of the other cities that have tried it and, and now are looking to bring police back and probably will be unsuccessful with that in the short term. Uh, they've, you know, they've, they've attempted it and realized it was a bad idea. I think the wise, the wise entity looks at other similarly situated entities and learns from their mistakes rather than repeating them. So that, that, that's my perspective on it. Thank you, and I see the gavel. Yeah, Councilor Mejia, if you're all right, we can hold the rest for the next round. I just want to let. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Um, all right, Councilor Campbell, and then it'll be Councilor Edwards. Councilor Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Bach. Just a couple things. One, we did get some responses to some questions, um, but we did not get uh, responses to every question that we sent. And we sent a lot, and I know you read a, read a lot into the record. So we'll re-up those questions for a response from the department through you, if that's okay? Yep, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I just wanna pick up on something Councilor Mejia said. I think when talking about whether it's stop and frisk or stop and search, and I, and I understand, Lieutenant, the, the legal ramifications and, and I absolutely understand that, but we also live in the reality and the fact that as counselors, we are hearing from constituents when policing does go wrong. And I think you guys are as well, where someone is stopped, wrongfully stopped, searched, frisked, whatever it is, um, and they feel violent. They call us, they tell us about it. We then call, maybe it's Nora, other folks within the department to get some type of accountability. So I do want to stress that when you say it doesn't happen, it does happen. And even in one of the hearings that we held on the council side, uh, where the department wasn't present, we had folks come and share experiences where that happened. A college student talked about being stopped. Uh, another uh, gentleman had a video. And so there are instances where it goes wrong. And I would say in any department, even on the council side, there are instances where interaction goes wrong. The question is, how do we hold folks accountable when it does happen? So I have a couple of questions, and I think maybe they're big picture. From the perspective of folks on the Zoom, I'd be curious to hear, one, has the department ever restructured in such a way that it actually sent certain units back to the district, back to the captains, to provide greater coverage, to rein in replacement costs as a way to rein in overtime? That's my first question. The second is, does the department agree that the budget right now and going forward is unsustainable? That the way in which we are going as a city, we should all be concerned, I think, with respect to the budget. So I'm curious from the department's perspective, does the department think this budget is sustainable? And then my third question um, is, where does folks on this call, where does the department need to do better? Because I, it's one thing to go through a whole bunch of budget hearings, and we, we ask this of all, all departments, where does the department need to do better? Because I think folks want to hear more of that. Where does the department need to do better, and what strides are they taking to do better? And those are my three questions. And the last is just a comment on whether it's the Councillor Campbell, we just lost you. I just muted myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're saying the last is just a comment and then we lost. Yeah, it. just a comment on just the RAND report. Of course, I'm following what other cities are saying with respect to policing, reallocate, reallocation of budgets, et cetera, because we, of course, want our city to be safe while at the same time we want to be direct, directing resources adequately to respond to the root causes of violence. And I've been stressing that. The police department alone cannot solve the issues of violence in the city of Boston. It's impossible because the police cannot move people out of poverty. 
You cannot show up and provide mental health supports, right? Trauma supports at the scale in which we would need to be able to solve the incidents of violence and remove them. Provide jobs, for example, economic opportunity, critically important. The police department can't do that. So the question is, are we resourcing the other departments in the city of Boston, departments or organizations external to us to address these root causes of violence? That is critically important. And that's, for me, what this reallocation conversation is about. It's a police department budget that is $400 million. Then it's looking at Office of Recovery, for example, the Health Commission, the Economic Development, all these departments charged with helping us address the root causes of violence, them not having the resources that they would need to complement the efforts of our police department. So that's what this conversation, at least for me, is about. And I really want to stress that the police department alone cannot do this. Um, and, and so the question is, how do we figure out how every stakeholder, including community, can show up and do their part so we're all successful in solving incidents of violence in this city, reducing them so everyone feels safe, every neighborhood feels safe, communities feel protected um, and not over-policed, right? If some communities feel under-protected, over-policed. How do we get rid of that? Uh, phenomenon and reality for many communities. So just wanted to, to name that point. And those are my questions. I'm sure I only have a few minutes and can wait for the next round. So thank you, Councilor. You know, I would say regarding the, the police department's capability to address the root causes of violence, it, obviously that, that's that's not a role that we are well suited for. Uh, we can be part of a whole of government approach to addressing root causes, but you're right. There's no way we can do it alone. However, there's no way we can simply stop responding to some of these things. And, and as much as I would like to see, even if it comes out of the police budget, as much as I would like to see recovery services and public health and mental health services um, take the place of police responses, uh, I've been involved in numerous discussions over the year to try to accomplish just that. And, you know, the police, in a way, have the easy job of just saying, "Sure, take these take these roles away from us, and, and someone else uh, pick up that capability." Having someone else pick up that capability is proving to be a, a lot more challenging than 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 I think other you know a lot of people anticipated because uh, a lot of these instances do require the police and, and the police would love to be out, out of the out of the business of, of policing homeless and mentally ill and people with addiction issues you know the, the reality is we there's not a lot that we can do for them with the exception of maybe the street outreach team so so yeah i, I agree that the root causes are much more important than than what the what the police department is is able to provide um but we're still called we're, we're still called every day our calls are going up year over year. So it's it's difficult to, to envision a way where reallocation is going to allow us to uh, to to meet the needs, to meet the requirements of the city. And, and you know it's it's not just the residents, it's it's the politicians, it's the, it's the government uh, level people that, that want us involved. So if we can find a, a way that we could be extricated from that and, and, and hand it off, that's that's great. But uh, but it's challenging. Um, do I think the budget is sustainable? I, you know, I, I suppose it depends on the economic growth of the city. I mean, sustainability is, is a relative thing in terms of, uh, in terms of, of what a city can afford. I, I think the the city's doing well. That doesn't mean we should spend more on police simply because we can afford it. But you know, sustainability is all, always an issue. We're looking, you know, certainly the, the federal government's looking at the sustainability of uh, of their expenditures. That, you know, that's that's just a, a fact of good governance. And uh, I, I don't. But this is four hundred million, a seventy million dollar overtime budget. I said the same. Thing the Boston Public Schools, the transportation budget that's 130 million and only going up with nothing to rein it in going forward is not sustainable. So I'm just curious specifically on this budget, do you think the 400 million, 70 million dollar overtime just going up over the years, nothing to rein it in is sustainable long term? Well, I, I think that the crucial part is nothing to rein it in. No, that's not sustainable. You, you can you can have an overtime budget that, that that's not that's not controlled in a way that makes sense. Uh, but I think that is an interesting comparison that just the school transportation budget is a quarter of the overall police budget. So uh, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Oh, how... I'm talking to them too. Don't you worry, Superintendent. Yeah. I'm talking to oh, them too I, about reining that in too. I so, know you are. I just, just, so for I'm me, that leads that to number. that other that that then leads to that other question, right? which is, you know, has the department ever restructured in such a way that units go back to the district, uh, to our captains as a way to 
provide greater coverage, reduce the cost of these replacement costs, rain and overtime budget? Uh, I don't think it's been restructured per se in, in a long time. I know back probably 25 years or so, they I think they took the motorcycle unit, which was much bigger at the time, and, and put them all in the districts. And, and I think they, they realized that the, the capabilities that they lost and uh, and, and some of the some of the lack of efficiencies uh, rendered that not not really a worthwhile experiment. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you this: in terms of the uh, the bicycle unit and and the gang unit, uh, the flexibility we have to use people all over the city to address instances of violence or protests or instances where we need to to plus up our presence uh, in an area, you know, to to save lives, to stop people from engaging in gun violence. Uh, the flexibility that, that those units provide us is, is something that we would lose. And, and we can't just simply take people from one district to another on a regular basis and rotate them around. It's, you know, there's got to be some continuity. So if you put people in a district, you do lose a lot of the flexibility. And, uh, you know, I don't think ultimately that the, the relatively... Um, I think it'd be relatively meager savings on the um, on the replacement costs. I don't think that it would be worth it um, to move. Those are the two main BFS units that, that we would look at. Uh, I don't think we'd get much out of that. We can certainly explore it and see what the what the numbers look like. But I think the operational impact would, would outweigh the financial benefit. I see the gavel. I think it's absolutely worth exploring because I know there are folks in the department who have a different perspective. And I think that's the, that's the challenge. We have to be willing to try some different things in order to rein in a budget that's not sustainable. I'll leave my last question because I see Councillor Bach with the gavel waving it around. It's just, you know, where the department needs to do better, and I'm sure Nora, maybe Superintendent Marcus, others, Lisa, of course, um, have perspectives on that. And um, I appreciate the responses that we did receive, and we'll follow up on other questions we need further responses on. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Edwards? Thank you, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, so I just I wanna start off with, uh, by first thanking, um, uh, I blanked on the name, but I apologize. I wanna thank um, Sergeant Moy, I wanna thank Nora, um, Superintendent Nora, and I wanna thank, and I again, I forgot his name and I apologize, our new community service officer in Charlestown um, they picked one, I want to thank Nora because we've been doing race talks in Charlestown and Nora came to the first one, brought the community service officers, uh, you killed it. You did a great job. And because of you and your leadership, it became a monthly thing. And so we're on our 11th one. We haven't missed it. We've gone to zoom. We've gone off. We've had, uh, POs, we've had officers, we've had law enforcement. And almost every single one of them, except I think two, which was about the time of the intensity of the protests uh, or somebody's verdict was coming out, honestly. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, I do, and it does make a difference. Uh, and I will say the kids look forward to talking and hearing and learning and um, sometimes even pushing back, but at, at the very moment, telling their story and feeling really heard by police officers. And so thank you. Um, I did want to, um, you know, I wanted to thank uh, my officers and A1 and A7 for their work um, on a regular basis. I know I have been able to pick up the phone and call them, both captains, uh, to check in to understand what's going on. And so I don't want uh, people to think that, you know, all of us are asking these kind of tough questions. Every single one of the counselors, myself included, pick up the phone and call individual officers all the time and work with them and learn from them and ask what's going on on purpose when we're dealing with now new, uh, what do they call the little, the bikes and whatnot are coming from the North shore and coming down into East Boston. So, and, and our response was we need a community meeting and the officers were like, we're on it. So I want to acknowledge that. I do think um, I, I have some specific questions, however, about funding and overtime um, and use, non-use of certain things. So I'm just gonna rattle them off, but I did want to acknowledge good work when good work is done. My first question is an update on um, cameras during overtime, body cameras during overtime. One, I'm, I'm curious if they're, they're required to be worn. If, if, if they are being worn, I think that helps with a lot of acknowledgement of transparency and what, uh, community trust building, and I want to make sure 
I ended that sentence um, on, on that particular issue. The second one uh, where we had, I think, a back and forth was specifically with schools and police officers. And I had a great conversation with counsel, or excuse me, Superintendent um, Casillas this morning discussing uh, the reduction in arresting officers' presence in schools. Seems like there's more of a concentrated superior, or superior, yeah, supervisory role that has a, arresting powers. But in the individual schools, you're seeing less police officers, more public safety officers or public safety coordinators that are employed by BPS. And I wanted to understand employed by BPS, meaning they don't have arrest powers. So if you can make me understand the difference, that would be very helpful. I also understand there's an MOU between BPD and BPS on information sharing. Just curious if anyone can give an update on that. And then I wanted to also discuss specifically, um, you know, I think some of the frustration I feel when I read the responses to the questions of my colleagues um, is what I see is we want to work with you to figure out a way forward. Uh, for, for me, I, I certainly do. Uh, the restructuring, the reallocation, the understanding how things can be better, we're looking for your leadership for that. And oftentimes the response is uh, due to contract negotiations, due to union negotiations, we can't move on this. So there seems to be no movement. Or the other alternative is we need more police. And, and that isn't creative and that isn't actually changing much. And so that's where my frustration comes from. I brought it up before, I'll bring it up again. Why aren't crossing guards who are in BPD used more for the de detail uh, to work on, um, I don't know, construction projects or to be there, um, especially if they're city projects and where public funds are paying for them? Why aren't we looking at, I know that there's civilian roles or police roles that civilians could be doing more of. And if the response is literally, well, we just have to negotiate that and work on the contract, I, to me, that's kicking the can. That's You're really just, uh, kicking the can down further to a conversation where we're going to have a head-to-head, -head, where we're going to have to deny the contract, because it does eventually come to the city council, because there's been absolutely no real change. So, again, I, I started off recognizing good work. I'll end with the same. I recently had a loss, and I had a wonderful experience working with BPD. And I just wanted to say that the officers were incredible. And they have been incredible and demonstrated that um, when I was falling apart, they held me up. So I, I do want you to understand, I see good work. I see it regularly. I've seen it for me personally, but I do have those questions. Thank you. Council Edwards, thank you for, for sharing that. I'm, I'm glad that the experience with the, the officers was, uh, was a positive one. Um, so, you know, that just a you know the, the easy one is the, the body worn cameras. They, they've been distributed, uh, and they, they should be uh, they should be out in the field for it's, it's a second camera. So, you know, I think there's been a lot of confusion about why officers weren't initially wearing it all the time, and the particular brand of camera we have didn't have the capacity to last for 16 hours. So what we had to end up doing, we wanted to prioritize the regular shift because we, we felt that was that was the best way to standardize it. And so that became a controversy of police officers not using it on, on overtime. So we went out and bought two cameras per officer. So that, that second camera has been distributed. We should have, uh, we should have officers uh, utilizing two cameras so, so there shouldn't be a period of time where they're out there um, exercising a patrol function uh, without a camera. So, so we should, we should be out there for all patrolmen and we'll look to expand that um, the other superior officers and, and, and others as we, as we move forward. But during um, overtime, they're also used. Now they are now, now they have two cameras. Okay. It, was, it was really a technological limiting factor of, of the battery, which, which is, you know, it wasn't, this wasn't something that was, that was bargained because we didn't want them to wear it on overtime as it, it was a, it was a 12 hour battery life. Uh, so, so we've got second, a second camera. So every officer has two cameras assigned to, uh, to that officer. So that, that's the way we solve that. Uh, the school issue, I, I think some of some of the changes in, in officer roles, I think, stems from the uh, the post law, 
So I think there's going to be changes to um, to how a lot of these officers that fell under the special officer category uh, may not be allowed to be categorized as special officers anymore. So I think that's going to have kind of a wide ranging effect throughout some of the special officers employed in various city agencies and, and some of the privately employed special officers. So that will um, that they'll have to they, they can't be called police officers, they'll have to be called something else and, and, and have a different role uh, and, and won't have arrest powers, as you mentioned. Uh, as far as the MOU with the information sharing that that's been around for a number of years, I, I don't know of any changes to that. I think it's I think it's still in place, and, uh, and unless it's something that happened recently. Um, so as far as the contracts, yeah, there's there's lots of creative things we we could do, but we are bound by the contracts, and and you know, I think there's some. Uh, the police department doesn't negotiate the contracts entirely. You know, we, we have a labor unit that, that kind of looks at the contracts and deals with, deals with labor issues, but it, it's really it's really a city hall function um, to, to negotiate and, and decide does this, 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 this Boston, the, the city labor council really follows through on the contract negotiations. So uh, as a member of the command staff, there are plenty of things that, that I would change with the swipe of a pen if I could, but I, I, I don't have that power. Uh, and, and I, I know that it's, you know, there's every big organization that, that deals with uh, organized labor, certainly I'm sure sees benefits to it and, and certainly sees uh, ways that, that it does restrict uh, how they can be agile, adaptive organizations. And, and, and I don't think that the police department's any different than, than other organizations in that respect. Uh, was was that it? The, the three questions, or did you have? I I think I only brought up the crossing guards as an example. I don't. I, I think that was. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's anything that prohibits uh, the city from from doing that. Uh, um, I, I don't know what level of interest there would be for some of the crossing guards to to do details, but uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that's necessarily within the police department's control. Uh, I, I know there was a, a law change years ago about using flaggers, and I don't know how the prevailing wage law versus if they were city employees, would they not fall under prevailing wage? I don't know if there's a benefit to that. I, I don't know enough about it, but but I'm pretty confident that's not within the the, the control of the, the BPD. I think if, if, if people wanted to make that happen at some level directly through public works or whoever issues the permits, I don't know if there's any influence that we necessarily have over that. Okay, well, I'll just say it may not be financially a huge difference but i mean it does it does free up some police officers to do policing work a little bit uh, more than that so no, I, i'm done was, with um sorry sorry i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off i just want to let count the bottom know that was that's it for me though in terms of questions and i'm sorry um uh officer mcgoldrick sorry to cut you off yeah, no problem. I, I just wanted to point out it, it really wouldn't free anyone up. We did; they just wouldn't be doing the details. You know, as as was mentioned earlier, like half the details go on unfilled anyways. But it doesn't really free them up to do other police work. This is something they'd be doing uh, on their own, uh, basically on their own time. They they pick up the this detail work, so they, they would either do it or they wouldn't. If they weren't doing it, they they wouldn't be in uniform doing police work. They'd be whatever, hopefully going for a run or going to the gym or something. I don't know, but um, you know. And I just want to add, Kevin, Councilor Ed, um, Edwards, I want to thank you for having those dialogues with us, um, especially during the time when there were protests going on. And like you said, after the first dialogue, um, you know, the relationship started to be getting built, the second and the third. And we purposely didn't show up to the dialogue because my big thing is I want the residents and the youth to know the district officers and build those relationships. And I watch you guys on Twitter, and I'm glad that they're continuing because it's really important to have those conversations. So thank you for allowing us to, you know, be part of your community. Uh, Council Edwards, I just want to echo what um, Superintendent McGoldrick said about officers not being able to be utilized in the districts. Um, on, it's true that 50, approximately 50% 50 of the details go unfilled every day. But if you're talking two, three, 400 officers on the street, none of those are on a regular tour of duty. So that's two to 300 extra officers that we're having on the street each and every day. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. Um, and um, I will do a second round now of questions. Um, I'll just ask a couple. One is just because uh, this, this issue of details and costs came up, and I think it came up with, with Councillor Arroyo. 
And Lisa, what I recall is that from the last set of numbers we got from you all, that the administration of the detail system all in, in terms of the number of, of officers we have sitting on the detail desk and everything, does in fact add up to more than the 10% administrative reimbursement. So it, we do technically spend money at, uh, on the detail system. Is that accurate? It's, it's correct. I mean, we've done several analysis, especially several years ago when there were, were talks about civilianizing some of these positions. And, and, and again, it, it, it does come down to bargaining. It does come down to switching units, which is beyond our control. But we've done analysis. The city does collect a 10% admin fee for private benefit details, which go into the um, city's um, general fund. But um, we, we've done an analysis of that it would cost more. However, it would cost less if we could get some of the offices back out in the street. But again, that, that again all comes down to bargaining. I would like to point out as well too that um, in 2013, we did convert our receivables over to the P, uh, PeopleSoft financials. So the, the receivables actually set on the city's bo uh, books. Um, based on the recommendation of the audit, we were asked to write off those amounts of those receivables. However, I do want to say that we've made tremendous strides in getting our receivable balances down. Um, my detail staff works diligently, and a, a lot of times um, the treasurer has asked us to meet with them to kind of go over our collection process because it, it's working and we're getting those receivables down. And, the, and the, the, it's, it's significantly, significantly less than it was back in 2013. No, that's that's great, and I think obviously it's completely essential that we get these monies from contractors. That I, I agree with you. I and, and my feeling is there's been several times when I've asked was asked to write off a vendor's receivable, and I refuse because I feel if this vendor is still viable and he's still out there, um, we we should still and we we cold call we cold call all the time. We, we act like a little mini, mini collection agency over here to try to get. Uh, I'm very passionate about trying to get those monies back from the vendors. Um, and I, did you ever figure out, I, I had asked a question about the paid administrative lead data, um, and then you guys provided the sort of updated FY19, 2021. And I guess I, I had also asked Lisa sort of like, how we ended up with all these different numbers floating around, just because the- Yeah, that I'm, I'm still researching, Counselor. Um, I did have a conversation with our OBM analyst on where the number came from that was reported on the operating budget, and she said it, 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 was, it was a report that was run. We're trying to reconcile that. We also tried to, rec and it's funny because when I was working on some of these answers last night, we ran a report, uh, we had a report of offices um, where they are in the districts, and then I ran a report on admin leave, and I'm hoping that this might show some of the disconnect is that, like, if you look at the uh, report I submitted with respect to officers by unit, it says that we have exactly 12 officers on admin leave. However, in another part of the report, I said we have a total of 17 people on admin leave, and I'm thinking that the Delta might be civilians versus the sworn. One question asked for sworn, one qu question asked for total, but I still haven't found out where that Delta is, but I'm determined, and when I do get that, I will share that with you. Okay, I mean, I'm 100% confident, though, that we have 17 people on admin leave, 12 of which are sworn officers, five are civilians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it just obviously it creates, I mean, for us, like, yeah, we want to be able to count on the reports that we get over from you. I, I agree. I and, agree. Um, and and obviously, when there's when the press gets one set of statistics and and then I get another one, it, it creates you know confusion and uncertainty, and then it's hard for people to know when things are you know it, sometimes it, in in atmospheres of mistrust, right? It makes people kind of question things. I, I agree, and I, I'd still like to go back and have the opportunity to see where um, who provided. The information to be you on that number. I'm also thinking too that you know admin leave is, a, is is constantly moving. If you run a data query today of how many people we have on board, and next week it, it could change, and you're always trying to find out where that delta is and where, where did some people go. Yeah, no, I understand that, right? But it shouldn't move so dramatically. And then I guess just um, one more from me, and then I'll go to my colleagues again. Um, I, I understand the. Um, I understand you guys referring some of these civilianization questions to the Office of Labor Relations, but it does seem to me that from a um, from a department perspective, like you know the 
the idea of civilianizing some of the desk roles in order to free up our sworn personnel, you know, to do sworn roles, which is a piece of the having more police officers effectively, right? Um, it seems to me like at some level that has to first be a policy desire of the departments before it's ever going to get passed over to the OLR folks as something to bargain for. Um, so I do think it would be helpful to understand in more detail along the lines that we sort of briefly touched on in July, where the department sees the opportunity, um, you know, to, to civilianize some of these roles. Because certainly to me, it looks like a lot of desk roles are written into the contract and um, it's hard to, given the fact that we pay sworn officers for their training, for their, um, for the hazard, like that we provide hazard duty pay. I think fiscally the city has a pretty strong argument for saying, if I'm paying somebody for hazardous duty, like they should, the sworn officer should be doing kind of police work. Um, and I, I do think it's reasonable for us as a council to kind of ask the department where it is on thinking this through, because I can't imagine that OLR is gonna bargain for anything until if until the department has said, yeah, this is a, this is a piece of what we want to see happen. I know it's been discussed in the past regarding um, some of these civilian positions and in police positions that are that are more civilian appropriate. Um, I just don't think it's ever gained the traction when you know, especially you know, numerous contracts ago when they went to arbitration. I think some things had to give. There's only certain there's only a certain amount of issues that could be arbitrated, and and I think that's where we lost some of the momentum. Uh, so obviously, a negotiated contract is, is the best opportunity to uh, to address some of those issues. Uh, I will point out for the last year, it really wouldn't have helped us because we lost the vast majority of our civilian staff and, and I think the the impact of that having to have uh, sworn officers even even replacing uh, some of the front desk civilians and other civilian staff um, did have an impact on us so uh, you know there, it, it, it wouldn't have done much last year but it's I think going forward the more people that we have uh, taking you know appropriately taking civilian roles would be beneficial Sorry, and in terms of losing civilian staff last year, what do you mean? Well, we had we have civilians that, that work at the front desk of various various stations, and you know be, because they're in you know whatever union um, some of the civilian staff was in, if they weren't going to work at whatever the treasury department, then then they they also weren't coming to work at the police department, even though you know some some of them were interested in coming in. But that person that we lost at the front desk, that's a spot that we had to fill. With a sworn officer, because we need a person at the front desk and you know take reports and, and handle things that, that happen in the station, where we could ordinarily have a civilian or you know in this case potentially now that we have the cadet program back, we would do have cadets take reports at the front desk. But there is a front desk role that has to be filled, and if a civilian's not there, and then we have to have a police officer there, which is is not the best use of our people. No. Oh, um, do you have a sense of the scale of those jobs that were replaced this year? I mean, is that a piece of what could have been driving replacement costs? Certainly, yeah. If there's if there's a replacement cost, um, if there was if there was no one at the front desk where we ordinarily would have had a civilian, then we would have had to fill that role. And is that uh, is that like is that something that we would be able to tell how much of that we did over the course of the year? I'm asking because I, I mean, I've already expressed, I think it's extraordinarily unlikely that we'll be able to get to 153 officers back. I mean, especially since that's actually calculated as though they were back on July 1st, right? So it would have to be, in terms of a staggered thing, you'd have to sort of get 200 people back over time. So I'm just trying to think about like, you know, is that, is that 10 people's worth? Is that 30 people's worth? Like, what did that look like in terms of its impact for us in the last uh, it's year? At, at least 10, uh, that depending on which station. Usually that you could have a civilian at the front desk on, on days and maybe on a first half shift as well. Uh, I don't think every district has them on both shifts, but it would be, you know, be between, between 10 and 20 uh, that we would have to have an officer fill that role or a cadet. So, I mean, the, the cadets helped us out quite a bit, obviously, there. Uh, the, more cost effective and they, they don't have some of the training. So it's not it's only you're, you're um, you know, filling someone in a position that that, that has training that, that exceeds what um, what their role is. Great, okay, um, I'll be going to Councilor Arroyo. I just, one last comment from me is just, I do think there is probably a, I mean, I think the thing that would preclude us from doing what Councilor Edwards suggested right now with the crossing guards is the contract in the sense that 
the contract gives our police department first bite at the apple of details and it goes through the detail system right which is dictated by the contract so i don't think i don't think even diverting them to another fort right could be done um without contract change i do think that there is a pretty strong argument that we could be redistributing unfilled details to a civilian workforce once they've gone through the opportunity for the whole department to claim, like the, you know, the police to claim them. And it, I'm not at all convinced that that would require a contract change. Um, so I do think that's something, you know, we might want to talk further about, um, given the large number that go unfilled. Um, and, uh, and the sort of like, you know, the workforce development opportunities that could provide for some civilians in the city. Um, but uh, that's more of a comment. Um, Councilor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and so uh, we've sort of been all around the circuit now. <laughs> uh, and so I'm just going to go right back into the uh, audit from 2015. because I'm just trying to figure out, you know, I know we're doing new studies. We, we keep coming up with things that we could do, but we've already done one that was done by the mayor with the participation, the full participation of the police command staff. And I'm just trying to figure out what we got from that. Um, so I'm going to finish up those questions and I'll, I'll go in a different direction. But uh, one of their findings on page 17 was that the current organizational structure of the department, while creating clear lines of reporting, may not be optimally aligned. Some bureaus and divisions are large and assign many direct reports to a single superintendent or a deputy superintendent, whereas other superintendents do not have any direct reports. The span of control for those holding the same title is varied, creating an inefficient deployment and reporting structure. Have we done anything to change that? Have we changed the bureau sizes or the amount or anything since 2015? I don't think there's been significant changes since 2015 uh, relative to the size of the bureaus. Um, you know, the bureaus have, have different functions. You know, my bureau is essentially all of the all of the uniform officers generally. Uh, investigative services, a smaller bureau, but still significant. Um, and like administrative uh, bureau of administration and technology uh, doesn't have that many officers assigned to it. But the the complexity of, of what they um, do. I don't want to cut you off, uh, but just in terms of time, you know, I'm just going to try and stick to the exact things I asked. So basically. We haven't reformatted that at all and since 2015. Um, one of the questions I have for page 37, uh, and I'm quoting again, it says, the department has not conducted a detective workload assessment to ensure that all bureau division units and districts are properly staffed. Have we done one since then? This was 2015. Have we done a, a detective workload assessment? I don't know if we have anyone here from Investigative services, I'm not aware of one, but that doesn't mean it wasn't done. I don't know if any of the other superintendents or if Lisa knows. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, a, I, I don't know, um, and there is no one in attendance, but I can sure, um, surely circle back with um, BIS and get that information to you, Council, but I, I can't answer that right now. I wouldn't thank know. Thank you. Thank you with, with, with that. And then we'll, hopefully, the, thank you for the, the offer to circle back. I hope to, to get an answer on that. The conclusion, we'll just jump right to that, page 63. Uh, it says this report provides the city and the department with a review of major areas for further investigation analysis. And the next steps in the process include the following. And I just want to go, it's three steps. I just want to see if we did any of this. It says the first one is the department needs to create an internal action implementation plan for review of the recommendations. Did that ever happen? Can you repeat that question again? It says the department needs to create an internal action and implementation plan for review of the recommendations. Did that ever happen? I'm not aware of that. The second step said the department needs to memorialize a strategic plan to ensure efforts are planned and institutionalized. I'm assuming that didn't happen either. In terms of specifics, the specific strategy laid out in that report? Um, specifically to the recommendations out of this report, yes. Uh, not that I'm aware of relative to that report. Obviously, there's strategic planning that, that goes on, but I don't know how much they incorporated. Uh, did in, in full disclosure, I was not a member of the command staff in uh, 2015, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Good to know. That's helpful to know. And then the third one is the department needs to enhance its performance measurement process to track progress of changes suggested in this report, along with general measures to track crime and quality of life issues. Is that something that's been taken up since 2015? I think the BRIC does an excellent job of tracking crime and quality of life issues. So, so yes. Did it exist in 2015? 
Uh, I don't know. I, I would say that the brick is has a more robust capability to do that than they did in 2015. I'm not sure if it was in response to that report or, or just a, a capability uh, assessment that um, that they that they didn't enhance their ability to. You know, I, I think that the brick is, is well positioned. They get better all the time. So the reason why I'm asking is specifically what they say is the department needs to enhance its performance measurement process to track, and this is the important part track progress of changes suggested in this report. So would BRIC be giving me data on the changes that they've recommended in this report for BPD? No, not, not specific to that report. They, they, they monitor, you know, crime trends and, uh, and data like that, but not nothing. Not I'm, not aware, of yeah, I'm, not aware, I'm not aware of any formal implementation of that report. Uh, again, I, I wasn't here in 2015 as a member of the command staff. Okay. Uh, so that's it for the report. Uh, it it's, doesn't look like much was done with that report, at least on the surface now. Maybe there'll be some answers that come off of this that shed more light on that. Um, I want to go back to, and, and one second, just so I can get myself organized here, but we sent in questions regarding um, details uh, and specifically what came out of that uh, it was a 17F, we got a bunch of information back. What came out of that information was essentially uh, that Melnia Cass was coming up under the special events code. So all of the overtime that was being utilized in Melnia Cass was being classified as quote unquote special events. And so my question, and it was a lot of overtime, it was, it was an extensive amount of overtime. It didn't seem very special, it seemed sort of uh, regular. Uh, and so the question that I have is, how does BPD determine what classifies as a special event when they're coding their their actual overtime? Well, it depends on on which type of special event. Some some of these special events are reimbursable, um, so so that would that would play play into it. Um, for for Mass and Cass, uh, I, I agree, I wouldn't necessarily consider that a special event, but the fact that they uh, delineated that over time specifically, I, I think, uh, I think was functionally important. I, I think naming it a special event uh, was, was probably a misnomer, but the reality is uh, tracking that money as they did, uh, regardless of whether it's called a special event or, or anything else, I think it was important to know how much we're spending on that, which is essentially part of the Mass and Cast 2.0 plan that we were committed to. And this is not something that the police department sought to do, but we were plugged into a, a plan and, and that was sort of a, a non-negotiable uh, way that we needed to, to use police resources to impact that area. And just so that I'm clear, I, I think it's great that you track, I mean, all over time should be tracked. I think the reason that I'm asking this specific question, just to be clear, is for me, and I think most people when they hear special event, they think maybe a protest or a demonstration or maybe a parade or something that is in fact special. The Melnia cast over time is routine. And so when we get into breakdowns of your overtime usage and we say this part is for say special events and this part is for replacement costs and this part is for court overtime, Special events for most people would would make them assume that that is for sort of unavoidable events like uh, a parade or or elect the election week uh, staffing or things like that. Whereas this is more routine and regular and, and really doesn't fit in that nicely into that niche. And well, so I think it's really important that when we're being clear about sort of these staffing issues that we're we're staffing them or or we're reporting them in a way where you can, at a surface level, understand them. Um, and just in, in terms of, so that, that was my reason for, for that. And I don't want to get drawn off because I know we, we have a lot of time and I don't want a third round. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that I, I got, and I didn't have a whole lot of time to sit with it, but I have the, uh, I got it today. It's essentially your staff breakdowns, I guess. It, it's your, your district breakdowns of staffing. Um, which, you know, I'm not going to pretend that this is easy to read for me. It's not. So I didn't have a lot of time to go through this and, and actually fully digest it. But I guess what I'm trying to figure out here is in terms of the things that are broken down by district, and those numbers are here, right? This breaks it down by district, if I'm not mistaken, not just divisions. Correct. It should it should encompass all of them. Uh, I think Lisa, Lisa produced this report, yeah, but I, my, my understanding is it encompasses all of them. 
Yeah, so it looks like it does because I have it district. Puppets is, it, it all and it's all it's and it's sworn. It's all sworn. Yeah. And so I just want to. Yeah, no, this this looks like sort of the answers I was looking for last week. So I actually appreciate this break, but I haven't had a chance to go through it. But what it doesn't tell me is if I'm not mistaken, BPD works in three shifts, correct? They have three. They have sort of a three shift structure for officers on patrol. Yes, in the districts, yes. And so does this report, and I haven't had a chance to go through it, does it break down how those numbers break down across three different shifts? No. No. Okay. And so I know that the municipal code 11 that I cited is supposed to give us that breakdown weekly in terms of shifts and how many people are, are on leave and how many how many people are getting staffed in those shifts and how much overtime is on those shifts. I would love to see us become in compliance with that uh, soon. I mean, I don't know what you guys need to make that operational in terms of being in compliance, but we are out of compliance with that. It's supposed to be a weekly report. It's supposed to be uh, in the past, it was in, included in our city council packets, which was on a Monday, so when we received those. And so it was every week. I'd love to see us back in compliance with that because it helps us get to this issue. And the reason why I think this is beneficial, just for everybody uh, to understand, is I think there's a fundamental distrust with whether or not we need more officers or not. And that distrust comes from the fact that we don't see these staffing levels. We don't get to see how you're shifting. We don't get to see whether or not that overtime is mismanagement, deployments being done incorrectly, whatever, or if it's simply a matter of, of numbers coming down. Just like that study says that some of the things that they saw didn't make sense, like for instance, increases in some of those citywide units somehow also subsequently led to an increase in overtime for those units. So even though it was getting more staffing, the overtime costs were not going down, they were going up. And what I think this would do is I've heard repeatedly from both, I believe yourself, uh, Superintendent Goldrick, but also from other folks that we do need more officers. I've also heard the opposite. And unless we actually have raw data that I can go over and say, okay, this is what it is, I, we can't have real honest conversations about that. We just can't. And so because Code 11 says it, lays it out in plain sight that we should get these numbers, my hope is that we can do that and we can advance these conversations in a way that's productive and not just opinions one way, opinions the other way, but with actual data and actual things on the ground, uh, which exist. And, and frankly, it's concerning to me that I haven't gotten them because that doesn't bode to me that I feel like if you really needed more staff and more personnel, you'd be in a rush to give me this data. It just hasn't shown up. And so that's that's the concern that I have with that. I just want to be clear about that because I'm not coming at this from the standpoint that you're necessarily wrong. I'm coming from the standpoint that I want to see this data to make a, an actual objective finding on those claims, and I can't do that. And that's not how it works for other departments. When we need more school psychologists or school nurses, they don't say, yeah, you know, uh, I can't tell you how many we have, and I can't tell you necessarily what shifts they're in, and I can't tell you what schools they necessarily cover at what times, but we definitely need more. They give me that data, and then we say, okay, you definitely need more. So I, I would just suggest to the department that it helps this transparency helps. When we get this data, it helps bolster any argument that you're making about staffing. It is 100% helpful to give us the raw numbers and how they're structured and how that works, because then we don't have to do what he said, she said, maybe, perhaps there's mismanagement, maybe there's not. We can get to the bottom of it and we can get some solid ground and consensus. And so I just hope we get back to being in compliance with that. I thank you uh, for the answers that I do have. I hope we do get a follow-up on whether or not a study was done. I know we're going to do, and I see the gavel, so I'm going to end it on this. I know we're trying to do a workload assessment. I, I believe that's what we, was said at the last hearing. We're trying to see the hours and, and sort of the staffing levels and things of that nature. And if we did one in 2015, which we paid good money for, they worked with the department for, and we got nothing from it in terms of structural changes or fundamental changes or anything, I, I'm really hopeful that we, we break that and that we start to implement some of these things because I think that's for the benefit of the city the department for everybody involved. So thank you uh, for that. And, and I appreciate the uh, the indulgence, Madam Chair, and, I, and I'll be done there. There's no third round for me. Great, thank you so much, Councilor Arroyo. Um, Councilor Braden, you're muted. Unmute, unmute myself, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I really appreciate the comment about recently injured uh, officers going straight, getting immediate attention with our health and trying to get them 
uh, attention quickly as a physical therapist, the sooner you get uh, address those issue, issues, those injuries, uh, the quicker they're going to recover. Um, I want to circle back again to the 153 officers that would need to return to work. Um, I, I've been Googling to find Brighton Occupational Health. I live in Brighton. I've never heard of it. And where exactly is Brighton Occupational Health located? Actually, it, it, it's under a different name, Councillor, but we always refer to it at Brock, uh, Brighton Act, um, Brighton Occupational Health. If I have a few minutes, I'll actually pull up the contract or I'll ask my contracts manager to, to give me the exact name. So it's it's a different name than that, but it's yeah. just Brighton. Um, I, I, I apologize may, for that. But we yeah, all, that's we, fine. We you can put it in the chat or whatever. Um, you know, I just feel that this is a big lift, as, as Councillor Bach um, mentioned. You know, this is a huge lift to try and uh, get 153 officers back uh, in on duty uh, in whatever capacity they're able to after an injury. Um, so uh, do we have any sort of benchmarks? Like, do we have any targets going along? Like, oh, we hope to get... Um, some some metrics on on how quickly and and then some metrics on folks that just it doesn't look like they're going to be able to return to work and then what mechanisms are triggered then to work on having them be retired with their full benefits so we don't have metrics yet i'd, I'd like to get there um i'm hoping that we'll start building up mo momentum now that we're returning to work and that you know things are opening up um, with respect to officers that most likely can't return or perform their essential duties as a police officer, we've kind of, we've put the stake in the ground that if, if you've been out two and a half years and we've done everything we could to, you know, we will obviously send you to like a, um, a specialist in, in the area of which you were injured or services needed to determine, you know, is this correct and saying that this officer will probably never be able to physically able to move his or her arm and won't be able to pull, perform. The, you know, we, we will do that. But when we've, we've done everything and it doesn't appear that the officer will return at the two and a half year mark, we've started to move them through the involuntary retirement process. Um, we just recently sent 64 files up to the retirement board, um, you know, for involuntary retirements for officers that have been out two and a half years or more. Um, you know, once it goes into the retirement process, again, it's out of our hands as, as far as what they need to do on the retirement board. And I worked at the retirement board before, and it's, it's a pretty cumbersome, thorough process because, you know, any accident of disability is an additional cost for the, the city because you pay for the indemnifications of perpetuity as far as their, their medical bills. However, I will say that the retirement board, um, we're in constant communication with them and they, they are aware of how um, aggressive we wanna be with these retirements. So we're hoping they will move, but I, I cannot predict how quickly they will move because they have to go through a three panel um, review of doctors, there's a hearing. Some of the offices might not show up for the appointments that they make for these independent doctors to be seen. So so there are some, some hurdles that we face. Um, I'm just hoping that the momentum with our OCK Health triage and with Brighton OCK Health that we'll be able to grab the low-hanging fruit um, with those offices that have just got injured to give them a call. You know, why don't you come in? Let's do a follow-up. Do you need do you need do you need physical therapy? Let's send you over to Brighton OCK Health. Would you be would you be willing to go see them? It's a great organization. I am going to find that um, for you and put it in the chat. Um, <laughs> not to it, worry. It's under a different name. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I appreciate that. And as a physical therapist, I, re I realize that, you know, that decision to leave your profession that you've been in for um, all of your adult career and, and deciding to re retire is, is a decision. It's a, it's, a, it's a big decision for someone to take. But uh, I think having having an ex having a, 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 um, a an expedited uh, process, and as you say, it's a cumbersome process, but to have that process triggered automatically after two and a half years is it seems reasonable. But um, um, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you um, so much, Councillor Braden. For public records reasons, we discontinued the chat in uh, City Council Zooms. So um, if you find the name, Lisa, feel free to just share it with us. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Braden. Um, next up, Councillor Flynn and then Councillor Mejia. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Buck. Councillor Buck, my questions um, were all, all asked, so I, I don't have any follow-up questions. Great, thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Mejia? 
Um, yes, uh, this, I only have one question, and I really do appreciate um, just the patience and, and just how much you all are, have sat through this hearing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm just really curious. Um, we, I recently read an article in regards to um, hiring some consultants um, and to maintain a network of more, I believe, um, a thousand surveillance cameras across the city of Boston with remote access to nine different cities. And I'm curious, can you tell us how much um, a system like this will cost? Um, and where is this money coming from? And how does this RFP square up with our anti-surveillance um, ordinance, which we passed? I'm not aware of that RFP, Counselor. No. Okay. Not, okay. Is there a name for the RFP? I, I could, I'd be more than happy to see if we have it, but I mean, I'm... There was I, an I, article that I, let me, I can look for it and... Because I, I, every RFP will initiate with me as, you know, um, you know, doing, you know, a um, request for approval for a chief procur procurement officer. So it starts here, it starts in my office, and I'm, I am not aware of that RFP. Nothing, uh, nothing ha have I seen going across my desk as an RFP, but um, I'd gladly help you out if you, you could share some more information on it and I could double check for you. Uh, Lisa, I think it was, um, it was actually put out by the Office of Emergency Management. Oh, um, um, or, okay. yeah, where it was, um, Boston, I guess we're the agent for the um, urban area security initiative grants for the Metro Boston Homeland Security region. Um, so it's like a camera plan that uh, operates across eight cities, including ours. Sorry. So it must be funding through UASI then? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think the issue at hand is that the, it sounds like the, the immediate coverage so far has been that, oh, well, we're just doing this as a fiscal agent for the consortium, but it's not clear that the, um, that the camera, uh, sort of surveillance protocols and such there are in line with, as Councillor Mejia says, the facial recognition um, ordinance that we passed and potentially the surveillance oversight ordinance that is, you know, up for consideration before the council. So I think that's the issue. Um, I, I don't have specific information, but I can gl gladly circle back on that with our telecommunications director, because he is, um, I'm sure, fully aware of this and I can get in from information more on the specifics where it relates to Boston, but I, I don't have any information available on that right now. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Councillor Bach, for the interpretation and translation and support there. Thank you. I'm oh, happy to. Um, I, I also, also saw it with concern, so um, thank you, Councillor Mejia. And then I guess I, Councillor Campbell had to jump off, but she did ask me to kind of um, to pose to you all in what would have been her time that the sort of last question she asked, which is really kind of, you know, obviously in different ways, you're all leaders in the department. Um, what feel like sort of the next frontiers for the department to be better? Like, where does it feel like we're not, um, we're not achieving all that we could from your perspective? Obviously there's lots of folks on the outside who have lots of views um, and counselors have our views, but it just would be it would be helpful to hear sort of what feel like the um, the important areas for improvement from from the department's perspective. I would say currently the data that we have our stats relative to the, the safety of this city are probably the envy of, of most other cities. We, we did not experience a tremendous rise in violent crime or any of the part one crimes. But I think what we could do better is uh, the perception that that the department isn't as effective or as professional as we are, I, I think is is something that is uh, kind of in conflict with um, with the data. I mean, I think the data shows uh, that we're doing great work and, and that doesn't happen by accident. That's that's a lot of people on uh, doing the right thing, doing the hard work every day. Uh, but I don't think that that's being translated effectively to certainly all members of the public. I, I think certainly there's there's been some uh, there's, there's been some views on what the Boston Police Department is that is uh, not consistent with my experience over 
uh, 30 plus years with the department and and with frankly with the results that we've delivered so I, I think we need to uh, I think we need to work on finding uh, finding ways to convey um, the dedication and professionalism that's shown that they got us to this point uh, with with a very enviable uh, record of accomplishment as far as uh, the stats. Like, I, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I was a police officer when we, when we had well over 100 homicides a year. And, and you know, the, the officers in, in, in my sort of peer group uh, worked very hard to bring that down to, to a, a, a level that is, you know, I think too high, but still way lower than, than most other similarly situated cities. Uh, what we need to do is translate that success uh, into confidence in the public that they were actually out there doing the hard work and have the, the best interest in heart. I'm not sure that, you know, when I read the paper and when I when I hear some uh, elected official speaking, I'm not sure that that, uh, that that message has been conveyed effectively. So I think that would be uh, one of the primary ways that, that, that we could be more impactful as a department is to, uh, to maybe it's maybe it's an issue of transparency, maybe it's an issue of engagement. I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how we would do it, but I, I think to, to represent to the people um, what the department is and what we do and how that squares with what we've accomplished, you know, in, in reality, I think would be beneficial. And I, and I would just add um, what Kevin was saying, you know, all that happens when you actually sit at the table with people and have conversations. So I think as a department, we um, can do a better job at going out into the community, working better with you guys, working better to get that message so people sitting at the table have difficult conversations and to be able to come up with solutions. Because at the end of the day, there's always one common goal that we're all sitting here talking about the budget is how do we make our city safer? How do we um, address the issues of social justice and everyone? How do we address the problems that people see in the police department? How do we make ourselves better? But we do that all together. So whether we are the um, solution, um, but like we said, when we're sharing the money, we also have to be part of the conversation. So even if it's not us, um, that is going to work on the save the school department aspect. That's so important to us because the end result of the kids, the end result of the families. Um, so we all have to do a better job that not being in our silos and to work together and come to a common, you know, a common ground of like what is our end goal and what's our shared vision. We all have to have our shared vision. All the city councilors, the police department, everyone that's working in the government. And I think um, you know, sitting down at the table and just building those relationships again and having those conversations, they might not always be easy, is the key right now. We need to come together and sit here, not be forced to be on a, you know, a budget hearing. Like Lydia said, you know, um, go another time and have um, conversations when we're not having a budget hearing and talk about problems that, you know, we all need to address together. We all have that responsibility and we all need to sit together and, um, you know, come up with solutions together. So I think we can do a better job. All of us can do a better job. Yeah, and, and for me, I'm going to echo what those two said, but I think part of the um, issues that we need to, to rectify is technology. Uh, but like Kevin McGoldrick said earlier, we're still doing every, a lot of paper, things by paper. If we can do like um, log out overtime electronically and things of that nature, it, it, it'll cut down on the work that we have to do. We want to work smarter, not harder. Um, I think in general, if we have a better sense of what we're doing and programs that will help us create a more efficient department, that's going to go well. It's going to be, it's going to allow us to be more transparent. You know, sitting here um, for us, not having so many answers for you is difficult as well. Um, but we don't know the, the answers that you're looking for unless the questions are posed to us. And so we really try hard to answer your questions. But when we find out how to answer your questions or give you the answers that you need, we need to find a way of rectifying that by technology and being able to put everything in one place where we can have it ready for you guys and you hey we can run a report boom you need uh, the amount of overtime for this particular district or how many officers are assigned to this particular unit maybe we can create a dashboard or something along those lines but technology is really key as to what we what we need to present to you guys a lot of times and we don't have the resources a lot of times to get some of these programs that we do need great thank you superintendent lisa any comments no, but I found out where the um, Frognock Health is. It's occupational, it's OHS Total Care, a division of OHS Training and Consulting. It's at 1340 Soldier Fields Road in Brighton. 
great. We will get that information to Councillor Reagan. She can do it a drive by. Um, see, see how it looks. Um, great. And then just a couple other questions for me. One thing is, um, you know, the city's looking at an open streets uh, initiative um, over on the transportation department side to kind of do a bunch more of that. I'm of the personal opinion that um, that in order, I, I would like to see us be able to close streets more often for kind of like, you know, events and stuff. And I, I think that um, we don't, I think we over allocate police officers to that work. Like I think that, and I think that then we end up in a situation where either it's, it's sort of prohibitively expensive for city departments to do these things um, or we're spending a lot of money on that. And it seems to me like there ought to be a way to, to make more of a distinction between ones where we really need people on site or ones where, you know, maybe we've got somebody in a penny who's not a police officer who's watching. Um, but, you know, especially when we're talking about sort of side streets and more neighborhood -y things, um, I don't know that it strikes me that that's going to be a limitation that's coming up pretty imminently based on something we want to do in the budget. And so I'm curious whether you guys have had conversations with other city departments about changing the protocols around, um, around those things. We have brought the transportation department in to, to help us solve some of our, our challenges. Uh, they, they do some work down at uh, North Station relative to uh, some enforcement uh, with, with parking restrictions. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure, are you talking about if we shut Newbury Street down or, or something similar? Or? So, so yeah, so there's the, basically we had the open Newbury and open Charles Street events and um, and I think what the city's looking at is, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we did an open streets event like in a bunch of different neighborhoods, right? So not just those kind of main streets. Obviously, Charles and Newbury are in my district, um, so I've seen those firsthand. But I think is the idea of like, oh, let's have a bunch more of these kind of temporary open street pop-ups. I think that doing that is going to be constrained by the current protocols we have on how much police presence we need to have. And it seems to me that that would be a pity. Um, and, and I will just say it is a personal bugbear of mine that at every open Newbury I have attended, we have shut the street. The whole message to people is that you get to walk down the middle of the street, like a pedestrian without a care in the world. And then we've had police cars insist on driving down the street in the middle of the open street event, which I just find unbelievably frustrating. So I guess well, I mean, if, if we, if we get a call to respond, we, you know, it's, it's, it, well, it's not, no, no, it's not that it was like, oh, we have to, we're we're here patrolling this event and so we will drive slowly down the street it wasn't a let's get through to get somewhere thing well but i i would point out that if if it's a two-person car they might be the only rapid car on, on that side of the district so if they if they park down by the public garden and they walk up to mass ave and then they get a call that they need to get to it's uh it'll be a bit of an arduous process to uh, to get back to their car to respond to a call so uh but but relative to your point i, I don't i don't understand why we would need a large police presence if a street is completely shut down, I, I think I think some transportation coordination could uh, could just barrier the street off. If you know if there's traffic to be done, then then yes, you, you need a police officer. But if if there's if a street is simply blocked off and there's signage or a message board, I, I don't necessarily know why we would need additional police resources there. Uh, it, it seems like that it seems like we could accomplish uh, your goal with uh, just a little bit better coordination and, and maybe having transportation, the transportation department put some barriers and signs and a sign board and call it good. Right. So is that, I mean, I guess part of that is like, I think for us to successfully have open streets across the neighborhoods, we are going to need to move more in that direction. So is that something that, that we have done in the past that the department is fine with that needs our protocols to be changed? Yeah, I, I think if if the police department and the transportation department got together and made an assessment and determined, you know, what, what's, you know, there, there may be a plan of barrier, putting a barrier at one location, we may decide for public safety wise, if we're not going to have a police officer here, maybe we move it, you know, a block one way or another, and, and yeah. maybe we take up more space than we really need. But, you know, the, the reality is, uh, I think with the right coordination, we, we can accomplish uh, what you're what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I think the city's, city's changing, and that's happening a lot more. And I think we have old rules that the city used to go by that we haven't looked at how the city is changing and developing. And so, like, these open streets and these open... I, I live in Rosendale, and they shut down the streets and have, you know, every night the restaurant's open. But I think there's old laws in place that we need to sit at the table, exactly like Kevin said, and look at that about how, um, you know, Boston's looking going out into 2021. So I think that's something we absolutely can have. 
And, and I would also mention it will probably benefit the individual offices as well because, you know, for many many of these events are, are fun events on weekends and nice days. And, and guess where police officers don't want to be? Uh, they don't want to be at work, especially if they're getting ordered in on one of their, uh, you know, the one weekend off they have every six weeks. They probably don't want to spend it standing in a traffic post. So, so I, I think it would be a, a win all around if we could accomplish some uh, some reasonable adjustments to to maybe what has been done in the past. And, and I'm, I'm sure there's a way to do it. Great. Yeah, no, like, I, I think that that it would be great for us to kind of do that reassessment as part of this initiative so we can have more of those. Um, and yeah, and I think and I think also that when we I mean, same thing, I think there's an opportunity to look at the shifts that go unfilled on the um, on the detail front. I think obviously the one point seven five million dollar pilot, which we will be asking more of our kind of follow up questions to OHHS about next week. Um, but uh, I know you guys are in coordination there, I think. I think really that has to be the solution. You made a reference, Superintendent McCoultrick, to the fact that, you know, best is a co-response. There is an appetite out there for kind of non-police um, response. And, and it seems to me like that's what the pilot has to um, smartly fulfill. On, you know. Yeah, the, and there is an appetite, and I bring that up pretty frequently, but I, I don't think we really have a huge capability. You know, the, the best organization, not just the co-response best uh, team clinicians, but that the separate best um, non co response people they have they have done individual response not through 911 so i think what we have to figure out is if a call comes into 911 either for ems or, or police and it's not necessary for for us to to go there there's no there's no threat it's a, it's a known patient that, that may need some follow up at their home uh, how do we do how do we divert that and, and you know that, that's something we're working on we, we're engaged in, in that process but uh, but I think it's you know building that capability is the hard part. I, I think once we once we actually launch that capability, um, especially if we can tie it into the 911, so we're not dispatching police. Uh, you know, and the police don't want to go to these calls because we recognize that, you know, while we do have some training, we also bring with us. Uh, you know, the potential intimidation factor. Not everyone's a fan of the police. Not everyone's comfortable with guns in their home or in their presence. So there, there are a lot of negatives to calling the police for someone that, that doesn't require a police solution to, to their problem. Uh, absolutely. And I think, um, I think, I mean, we've, my office, we've talked to a bunch of um, places around the country that have done this. And it does seem like Figuring out how to tie it into dispatch and and have that training to divert divert those calls appropriately is pretty key. So, um, yeah. So we'll be following up on that. Um, I, yeah, I, I really appreciate you all um, coming back for the second round and and sending us these written um, answers over. Lisa, I'm sorry that it was your evening last night, um, but uh, but but we are grateful and and certainly um, we'll. Uh, be scrutinizing the the breakdown um, across the different across the different um, units, and appreciate the context on the training and um, and on where we are on the OPAT goals as well. Thank you for including that. That um, I think is just a really important reference for the council. Um, you know, I, I will I'll follow up sort of formally on a few of the other things that were asked today, just around you know like shifting and reports and stuff. Um, but uh, you know I. I continue to feel like it's hard for us as the council to buy the overtime cut when we don't really have a way to get there from here. Like I, I appreciate right putting a numerical value on kind of what is the ground that would have to be covered to make that real. Um, it just it does feel like without the without a sort of like interim game plan, it's not the kind of thing that's likely to happen from keeping our fingers crossed. Um, so I think, you know, I think we're gonna have to continue to have conversations on that. Um, and uh, yeah, and and on on lots of on lots of other fronts, I, I certainly think that uh, I, I certainly think that, um, you know, trust is a complicated thing. And, um, and that it was one of the reasons that the alternative pilot is so important, because I think, like, you know, a piece of this is that when we put we put police officers into situations that are not what they're trained for and not what a, what community is asking for. It doesn't work out well for anybody, um, you know. And uh, yeah, and obviously there are, uh, you know, we there are things. We, I think about the sort of non-fail shooting clearance. I think about 
um, you know, when we have fatal shootings, there are there are really significant things that we want you all focused on. Um, so I think uh, we've run through questions twice from everybody. Um, I think that that um, is it from the council. Um, so I'm going to go now. I want to thank you all. Sorry, I should allow you if, if any of you wanted to say any closing words. And otherwise, I'll go to public testimony. No, I just wanted to thank you for having us today and, you know, taking the time to allow us to answer the questions as best as we could. And we hope to continue this conversation. Absolutely. I'm, I'm confident that we will. Um, all right, great. Well, thank you. And now I'm going to go over to public testimony. Um, so if folks are watching uh, who are signed up for public testimony, now would be the time to come back into the Zoom. Um, but in the meantime, I see I've got Becky Pierce, so I'll go to Becky first. Um, and then uh, and then um, if Fatima James or Judith or anyone else watching um, comes into the Zoom, I'll let you testify as well. Uh, Becky? Uh, yes, I um, I thought I was going to be last because I just signed up right before the hearing and I'm not quite ready. So could you put me later in the program? Perhaps. At the uh, so at the moment, I'm actually waiting on the other folks who signed up to, to log back in. So I don't have any of them. But if you want me to hold for a few minutes while you gather your thoughts, I'm happy to. Okay, thank you. I see that we've also got Judith Baker back with us. Um, so Judith, since um, Becky had asked if I could put her a little bit back in the order, if, you, uh, if you're ready um, to testify, I'd be happy to hear it. Thank you. Um, you know, I've listened to two days of hearings now and it sounds to me as if we're accepting the status quo. That is, we're accepting the fact that our kids are becoming disillusioned, they're staying poor, they're remaining segregated, they're getting in trouble with the law, and then the police do a wonderful job as in the end of that. And the whole idea of police reform is that we're going to address root causes. We are going to transition to a completely different uh, system. And I just don't get it. I don't understand why the counselors are asking questions that allow this sort of, okay, well, we're doing well here. We're doing well here. We need a little more money here. Maybe we could change that. That That's, that's not what the public has been demanding. We want to see a transition. And we want the city council to do that transition. Now, I submitted some written testimony. I won't read all of it. But I've been a teacher. I was a teacher in Boston since 1971. I live in Dorchester. And my students are, were, in the 70s, were all very badly off. They didn't have access to good jobs. Schools weren't meeting their needs. The community was very segregated and violent. It's not a lot different now. We're, we're living in the 20th century. And I don't understand why the city council isn't looking to push the police 
to what kind of a transition they could participate in and creating an overview of what that transition is. Whether you defund, whether you refund, whether you underfund, whether you, you know, there has to be done with a, with a sense of urgency that, that our communities are suffering. And I didn't hear anything in both days from the police or from many of the counselors about how we're going to make a transition to a much better, safer system. And the other thing I would say is the only crime anyone ever talks about is street crime. And I'm really tired of that. The biggest criminals in this city are not some 19-year-old kid who's trying to make a living on the street because he can't find a different way to do it. The biggest criminals in this city are those who are pushing people out of homes who are cheating them out of their mortgages and so on. And so I, I really want to see a different attitude. And I must say, I have a great respect for several members of the, school, of the city council, but I haven't heard from, from any of you but the, the base, laying the basis for that transition. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Becky? Okay, I, I, I can go ahead now. Great. I basically agree with everything that Judith just said. Um, my name is Becky Pierce. I'm a 77 year old white former Boston school teacher from long ago. And I have lived and worked in Common Square, Dorchester for 51 years, I calculated. Um, and I, I have seen the ravages of poverty, over policing, and all the other manifestations of systemic racism in my neighborhood, my heavily black neighborhood for this whole time. And it's clear that city services are woefully inadequate to meet the basic survival needs of my neighbors and, and let alone to allow them to, to thrive and have a life and, and move forward and, and get out of poverty and so forth. And, you know, and, and the, and the other thing is the level of trauma that people suffer from over policing and from from poverty and 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 just not being able to make it at all, even to a, a level of survival, constant eviction, constant, you know, um, violence and different things going on in, in the community and in their lives. So um, I am just along with a lot of other people that have been calling you and that um, um, recently I'm urging you to um, move and repurpose to meeting people's basic survival needs um, in our community to move at least $120 million from the police budget and um, that so many um, young people, black and brown young people and others have been asking you to do um, and um, put that into safety and wellness programming led by and designed by the community and completely disconnected from law enforcement, the mental, mental health services. It's, it's great that the police department is trying to um, involve more um, mental health counselors and professionals in responding to mental health crises and calls that they get, but they shouldn't be getting those calls at all. That should be part of what's entirely led and designed by the community and completely disconnected from law enforcement. And so, um, and another thing that, is critical is to freeze all hiring in the Boston Police Department, no new police officers and no new cadets. And there need to be fewer police officers and a lot more functions that the police are doing now done by civilians that are people hired from the community who definitely need the jobs and that don't need to be done by the police such as anything related to traffic. Um, so I am just urging that um, this community demand that is swelling to um, 
to reinvest $120 million that's currently in the police budget into things that actually make people safer and have better lives and promote well-being in, um, in, in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, I will hold, I'm going to hold this space open just for a couple more minutes, just to check if, uh, if um, any of the other folks signed up are going to come and, and testify and then we'll close it out. But thank you to both Judith and Becky for your testimony.
everyone. Um, I just want to um, clarify. We, I think we're all set on public testimony. So um, I am. I, I thought I did this earlier, but I guess I must have been on mute or something. So I will now uh, adjourn this hearing. Thank you so much um, to everyone for attending and participating today. Uh, with that, this hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee is adjourned. Thank you.